So today we're going to talk about reimbursement request and we're going to spend just a couple of minutes on budget revisions, some content that you all will need to know today. Um, we talked about this in session one. We're moving to GovGrants as our grants management software solution because it allows um, both Metro government and our grantees to manage the whole life cycle of the grants within the system. We got Gov grants from a company called REI Systems. They've been a wonderful partner with us as we've um, configured the software to meet our needs. REI is a technology company providing application modernization, grants management systems and products, government data analytics and advisory services, and they help governments meet the demands of the 21st century. We have David Dabb from REI today. He's a business, business analyst there, and David has 10 years of grant experience. On this project, he led the gap analysis efforts and acted as the functional lead of the project, guiding the other members during the implementation phase. Uh, David, I think, is a wonderful trainer, and he's going to be conducting the training today on the GovGrants system. As I said, I'm senior policy advisor here at OMB, and I have over 13 years of grant experience, and I have a certification in grants management. We have a support system in place as you all get used to GovGrants. If you experience any technical problems, and I want to apologize for the few technical problems that we have had this past week, uh, but luckily they've seemed to be uh, fixed real quickly. But if you have any technical problems, you can reach out to GovGrantsOMB at LouisvilleKY.gov. We have some training videos and additional resources right now on our, our American Rescue Plan website on LouisvilleKY.gov. We are transitioning those to another site, and within the next few days, I will send out that um, web, web address to everybody. Going forward, we have a system where you can schedule time with our system administrator if you're experiencing technical problems. And then if you don't understand how to submit a reimbursement request or to complete your risk assessment, or if you're having problems with any of the processes or the grant pieces of your work, you can either email me directly or you can um, email American Rescue at LouisvilleKY.gov and one of us here at OMB will be happy to meet with you and walk you through, say, the risk assessment or whatever you're needing some assistance with. And that's not just in the short term. If a year from now you're working on closeout and you've never done closeout before, we'll, we're happy to meet with you a year from now. Before you start using the grants management system, you have to register your organization. The person who registers your organization should be someone who has authority over multiple grant programs, who can speak for your organization to some regard. It doesn't have to be your president, CEO, or someone at the very top of your organization, but it shouldn't be just a single program manager. It needs to be someone who, um, could submit applications for any grants your organization wants to apply for, or can submit um, a report or accept a grant agreement for your organization for any particular grant agreement you happen to get. Because we are going to be rolling this system out to our other Metro agencies, first with the external, external agency fund grants, which will be awarded next July, but the application process starts in January. So before we know it, 
you all who get external agency fund grants will be working in gov grants for for those grants as well once you finish your registration you can invite other users at your organization to register right now unless you tell us differently we're capping users at three per per organization because we have to pay for those licenses if you have five people who are going to be working in gov grants though send me an email or send an email to um omb um, gov grants omb at louisvilleky.gov and we'll move up that cap on your license number we have again some videos that show you how to register your organization and invite users on our american rescue plan site and when it, you're ready to go register you go to grants.louisvilleky.gov we have one more office hours session scheduled for this friday from 10 until noon if you're having any technical problems or you want to do your risk assessment and you have some questions for me, we will have those the, those office hours 10 to noon on Friday. It'll be me and our system administrator, Daniel Kalin. And Daniel's going to help with any technical problems you have during the office hours and ongoing. He's our primary support for the grants management system. And he's got uh, 15 years of information technology experience. Uh, Daniel, do you wanna say anything? I'll just uh, say hi to everybody and yeah, feel free to reach out to uh, uh, govgrantsomb at louisvilleky.gov email address if you have any type of questions or run into any problems within the system. Uh, we are working through some of the initial uh, rollout issues uh, that I'm sure a few of you have ran into and hopefully getting those ironed out pretty soon. And yeah, we, uh, I'll certainly be available as a technical resource for anybody who's having any type of questions regarding the system. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Dan. All right, so we're gonna talk about reimbursements. Uh, all of our ARP grants are paid on the, the reimbursement basis which means you spend your funds and you submit a request for us to pay you for your expenses. There are some Metro government grant programs that operate either by advancing funds to grantees or they have kind of a hybrid system where they advance you one payment and then pay you everything else on, on reimbursement basis. We're only going to talk about reimbursements today, but as the system rolls out across Metro government, we do have a training video on requesting an advance and we've got a user guide on that as well. But with ARP, it's just reimbursements. It's our goal here at OMB to get the funds out to you as soon as possible. We would love to get your reimbursement request on Monday and on Tuesday, send that payment request, approve it and send it off to accounts payable to pay you all. Absolutely, we would love to do that. We have brought in a whole staff just to review reimbursement requests. Some of them are here today and they're working very quickly on all of these reimbursement requests. There are a few things you all can do to help us review and approve your requests quickly. One is to provide details for all the cost. So sometimes what um, seems very sensical to the grantee might not be clear as we're reviewing the work, we're reviewing the request. And so providing those extra details can be very helpful. You can also submit all the required supporting documents. And we're gonna talk a lot about supporting documents today. The um, 
if we don't have a particular document, we've got to ask you for it, and then there's a delay with that. Don't worry, this is something that happens, but um, it, our ideal reimbursement request would have all of these things that are on the slide. The next thing is if you can organize your supporting documents to help us with our review. Sometimes we'll get a packet of 200 documents and they're not in any particular order and it takes time to figure out which documents go with which other documents. And as I said, as I said we're going to go through the required supporting documents. They're also listed in your grant agreement if you ever need to refer back to them. So how do we pay you all? Going forward, you will submit your reimbursement request in GovGrants. My team here at OMB reviews those reimbursements and approves them. We have at least two full reviews for every reimbursement request that we receive. And that's because the first person can always make a mistake. So one thing the federal government insists that we do is have internal controls built into our processes. And a really good internal control is having a reviewer and an approver. So the reviewer reviews and then the approver reviews and approves the request. So that takes a little extra time. Sometimes, as I said, we can get these reimbursement requests turned around within a day. Sometimes if, if you're asking for hundreds of different costs to be reimbursed, it's gonna take two people to review those hundreds of costs. So it takes a little bit more time. Once we review and approve, your request, we send a payment request to our accounts payable division here at OMB. We have a special queue for accounts payable where they process our invoices, our grantees reimbursement request within 24 hours, unless it's a weekend, of course, or a holiday. That is really fast. They implemented it just so we can get our payments up to you all. But once accounts payable author or processes your payment, it goes into a queue for a check to be printed. And that queue could be any size. So your check might not get printed that day or the next day, but it will be printed very soon when it the queue it has uh, lessened where every every payment request before yours has been paid. So it's just a few days. So let's say again, we get your request on a Monday and we have everything we need. We review it on Monday, somebody reviews it and approves it on Tuesday. We send it to accounts payable to get paid and they process it on Wednesday. That's a really quick turnaround time, and then your check will be mailed out as soon as the check is printed. That's the best case scenario, and that's the way we want to work with all of our reimbursement requests. So, there is one thing that, one other thing that you all can do to really help. We have to associate a purchase order with all of your grants. And if the grant expires and we haven't completed paying you all, that PO number, purchase order number has also expired. And so we have to have our, our purchasing department reopen that purchase order. And that could take up to a week. So one of the best things you all can do is when your grant is ending, send us the re last reimbursement request as soon as possible so we can get it paid before the expiration date. And the expiration date would be the date that's listed as closeout on your grants. Uh, Lori, what question do you have? I know that you 
are saying that we'll receive our reimbursement by the form of a check. If we are set up through ACH for other payments that we receive with LMG, will that come through our ACH or will it only be through check form? It, it'll be through ACH and I appreciate you asking that. The way you'll get paid from your, for your ARP grant, everyone, is through whatever method Metro government usually pays. Great, thank you so much. Of course, thanks. So financial reporting is mandatory. Um, you know, you can't operate this grant without sending not just your reimbursement request, but all of your supporting documents. Uh, we are using gov grants going forward. It's possible that in the next week or so, we might need you to just send us your reimbursement request the way that you've sent it previously, which is probably via email. But we're getting everybody's grants set up in GovGrants this week and next week so that the reimbursement request can be processed in GovGrants. When you report your expenditures, you need to make sure to report them at actual cost and not round up or down the expenditures. So, Supporting documents, we require two types of supporting documents for every cost that you charge to our grants. If you all have a neighborhood development fund grant, an external agency fund grant, a HUD pass-through grant from the Office of Resilience and Community Services, these should not be new rules for you. For those of you who have never gotten a grant from Metro government, it's been a few years, you might not be as familiar with it. But proof of purchase essentially means documentation that your organization incurred a cost. So that includes things like payroll reports, invoices, purchase confirmations, receipts, and things like that. We need a document like that for every one of your costs. But we also need to get proof of payment. And proof of payment is always one of two things. It is either a canceled check that you can see the canceled markings from the bank. Or it's your bank statement showing that there was an automatic debit or some type of payment withdrawn from your bank account. Every single cost, we need either the cancel check or the bank statement. If your bank statement has those little bitty copies of cancel checks in the back, as long as they're legible, we'll take that. You don't have to download a cancel check from your bank account or anything like that. We're going to ask that you all submit your supporting documentation by budget line item and I'm going to show you what that means in just a second. And we're also going to ask that, if at all possible, you put your proof of purchase and your canceled checks together in the packet that you submit on GovGrants. That makes it so much easier for us to say, yep, that's eligible, than if we have an invoice here and 50 page later, pages later we've got the check. And it's, it's just a much smoother process. And I'll show you that as well in just a second. Your bank statement, if you need to upload it, can just be a standalone document. We don't expect you to keep scanning pages of your bank st statement for us. Um, Lori, did you have another question? Yes. I just want to verify because Metro pays our accounts payable on our behalf. I just want to be clear that a payment doc and maybe a screenshot from the leak showing the check number that was applied to that invoice number would be sufficient as backup for you. Um, for 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 you all, it's possible we can just run the leap ourselves, and that might be more effective. Can I can I pull up leap, um, you know, maybe tomorrow and take a look at it and let you know what I think. Would that be all right? 
Absolutely. Let's work through it before we have to address it. And that way we know exactly what you would expect from us. Sure. I mean, it's, it's silly for you all to provide. And for those of you who don't know, LEAP is our financial system and Lori's with Kentucky Anna Works, which is one of our component units. So we use the same financial system. Um, I'll take a look at it either later this afternoon, Lori, or first thing tomorrow, and I'll send you an email. Great. Thanks, Susan. Of course. We, we don't want to, I know the rest of this training, the my part of it at least, is going to make it seem like Metro government wants to burden you all. It's not true. Whatever we can do to help make this easier for you all, we're going to do it. But we, at the same time, have to follow our established policies. And these are long standing policies regarding the reimbursement request. So here I said that we'd like you to upload your supporting documents by budget line item. David in a little while is gonna show you what that means as far as how to upload. It's actually a really easy process. But here is what I'm talking about. So in this case, the grantee has uploaded three packets. One of them is all of their payroll documents. One is all of their supply documents because they've got a supply line item in their budget, and then their bank statement. So if they had a line item that was equipment, they would have a document here called equipment. If they had materials, they would have a document that's called materials. This is all we're talking about. We don't want to um, make you all scan 15 different packets for us. It just facilitates the process if we have all of the like documents together. If you all ever want to come over here and join us and look through some reimbursement requests together, you'll see you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and then there was another piece on here where proof of purchase and canceled checks we'd appreciate if you could put together. And let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, it looks like I've closed that document. If you can bear with me just a second. So here's a fake receipt or invoice I made up. So. This is a receipt for XYZ printing or invoice. I don't know why I've called it a receipt twice. And then the very next document in the packet is the cancel check for that invoice. Does anybody have questions about that before I go back to the um, PowerPoint? And David's going to show you more when he shows you how to um, upload and how to put in the information in GovGrants. Susan, this is Delanor Manson. Um, I have a question about payroll. I mean, not everyone on my team is part of the grant. Mm -hmm. um, and then do I need to, I mean, I, I'm really getting very anxious here about <laughs> payroll and needing to send that over and then when they cash their check from their payroll, we would actually do it ACH. So there are no checks for them to cash. Sure. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over the payroll um, supporting documents in just a few minutes. And and um, hopefully that'll clear things up for you. And if not, um, we can talk about it longer during the training today. Um, I've got some examples. I think the examples will be helpful. Okay. Um, Lori, is your hand raised to go? Okay. Um, so when you, those of you who have had an ARP grant from us over this past year, 
we've had a form, an Excel form called a detail form that we've asked you to complete. And in that detail form, you enter by budget line item, what the cost is, the name of the vendor, if you've, you're submitting a canceled check, if you're submitting an invoice, what the canceled check number is, what the date is. And those are the same things that we would like you to report in GovGrants. So a very brief description of the cost. We don't expect you to write uh, a paragraph. We don't necessarily expect you to write a sentence, just a few words about what the cost is. We need to know the vendor's name if it's a purchase, the employee's name if it's payroll, the date of the cost, and whatever supporting documentation that you've submitted. So in this case, this is GovGrants right here, and David's gonna show you how to use it. Here is the description. They're paying their janitorial contract. If this just said janitor, that would be great. We've got the date, we've got the name of the vendor, the invoice number, and the check number. So what does this do? Why are we asking you to provide this? As we're looking through your supporting documents, when we see invoice one, two, three, four, we can say, oh, here's this, and we see check 5678, which should be that next document. We're gonna be able to go, yep, $600 on both of these documents, this is good, and we're gonna accept this cost. If it's payroll, here we've got the employee's name, we've got the payroll end date, and this grantee said that they submitted a payroll report in the bank statement. And here's the person's payroll, or um, you know, gross pay. So those are the things that we're looking for you to provide to us. I've got a few more examples on another document. So here we've got a purchase from Staples on 8-5. You have provided the Staples receipt and you paid with your business debit card so we can see it on the bank statement. Here is a payment from an invoice. We've got the date, the name of the vendor, the invoice number, and the check number. If you're charging us rent or a portion of your rent, some, some businesses, um, some landlords provide invoices for rent, but it's usually a lease. So here's the date of the payment, the vendor, you've provided us the lease. We only need the lease once, we don't need it again, unless the terms change, and then the check number. For payroll, here is John Smith's payroll for date ending 8-19-22. This uh, grantee submitted this payroll summary report and the total payroll report and the bank statement. And that's gonna make more sense in a minute when we talk about what to submit for payroll. And then here's somebody who doesn't have a payroll system. They paid B. Jones using Excel. They do their payroll in Excel. So they've sent that Excel spreadsheet and their canceled check. Does anybody have questions about how to enter that information into GovGrants? I mean, David's gonna show you how to actually put it in, but is that clear, the level of detail that we're asking you to provide? I know some of you have already been providing it on the detail forms that we have. So here we are, proof of payment. I already discussed this. It needs to be um, payment made by checks, automated clearinghouse payments, or debit card payments from your bank account, your the organization's bank account. If it's a check, it needs to be canceled, as I said. If 
it's a debit or an ACH transaction. We just need the page of the bank statement that shows that transaction. If you've got a 45 page bank statement and you're only submitting one cost, we just need that page and that's it. But we do need to have your organization's name on the bank statement. So we know it came out of your organization's bank account. Um, if you all are submitting your bank statements, it's very helpful if you highlight the items for us. We have one grantee who submitted a bank statement that was over 200 pages, and there were about 50 costs in there that we had to identify, and it's just very challenging if they're not highlighted. So credit card transactions, this is a bit confusing, so if you have questions, please let me know. Credit card transactions just mean that you purchase something. No funds leave your bank account when you use your credit card. They only leave your bank account when you pay your credit card. So if you're using a company credit card for making purchases, you're absolutely welcome to, but there's an additional burden on what you have to submit. We need to have your receipt or invoice, whatever the proof of purchase is. Then we need to have your credit card statement showing that charge. And then we need to have proof of payment that your credit card was paid. So that would be the canceled check, or if you pay automatically, it would be your bank statement. So remember on credit card transactions, we need that additional document, which is your credit card statement. Again, you don't have to submit the whole statement. You can redact everything on your bank statement and your credit card statements, except your, your organization's name and the transactions we have to see. We're not trying to look through all of your organization's spending we just need to have those documents to make sure that payment was made. For ARP grants, and this is largely the case for Metro grants in general, we don't allow cash payments. You need to make a payment using credit, debit, or a check. We also don't allow you to pay with something like a Visa gift card. You can use your Visa credit card, your Visa debit card, but if you submit a reimbursement request and it shows that you paid with a Kroger gift card or you paid with a Visa gift card, we're not gonna be able to reimburse you. All right, here is payroll. And we understand that grantees do their payroll in different ways. Uh, there are varying, varying levels of sophistication in your payroll processes and your payroll systems. So we're gonna talk, these two options are that you have a formal payroll system and it's either some sort of software that your organization uses like QuickBooks, or here at Metro Government, we have our own payroll system that's um, managed through PeopleSoft. Or if you outsource your payroll to a company called ADP, the rules are the same for these two largely. What we need to have is for every staff member whose time is being charged to the grant, we need to have a payroll report showing their time. Your payroll system might call the report a payroll summary. It might call it a labor distribution report. It might call it a million different names, but essentially we need to see that, that the person works so many hours at a certain rate and here's their total payroll, and here are, um, you know, the taxes and everything that come out of their payroll. 
So we need to see their gross and their net payroll. We're going to reimburse you for gross, don't worry, but we just need to have that information. If your payroll is paid in a lump sum, it's withdrawn from ADP or from QuickBooks in a lump sum from your bank account, we need to see documentation of your total payroll obligation. We don't need to see a payroll report that shows the names and payroll information of every single person who works in your organization. We just need a document that shows the total payroll for that pay period. I'm gonna show you an example in just a minute of what that would look like or could look like. Then we need your bank statement so we can say, oh, this total payroll is $100,000, and here on this bank statement, it shows a withdrawal of $100,000. We're good. There's one more document that we're going to talk about, which is a time tracking document. But if you can bear with me, I'm going to show you this other example first. So what do these payroll documents look like? I hope you'll forgive the quality of this document. I had to uh, go in and edit out people's names and their identifying information. But here is a payroll report that's called a payroll journal. And this is for a particular employee. I took out their name. So this person worked 80 hours and earned $1,000. Here's their withholding, and somewhere on here, it's got the date. So we have the information we need to verify the person's payroll. Here's somebody else's payroll that worked 48 hours, and here's their um, gross pay and net pay. If this person is not being charged to the grant, you can black out all their information if you want, or you can just send us this whole thing and you can let us know this is the person who's being charged to the grant. So this is the individual payroll. Here is a document from this grantee for their total payroll. And in this case, this report is called cash requirements and deposits. And their total payroll amount is this is a weird example and I apologize for it, but I had to go back through some really old files to try to find an example. <laughs> and this was the, the best that I found. So here it shows their total payroll was $4,654.90, except there was a four cent variance, which made their total payroll 48.54.86. And then they submitted their bank statement. And here's that amount. Maybe it was 465486. I can't read them. But those are the three pieces that we need. We need the individual's payroll. We need the organization's total payroll. And you can see on here, this doesn't list everybody's name. We don't, we don't need everybody's name. We just need this total payroll amount. And then here's the bank statement so we can tie it all together and say, yep, they paid their payroll that pay period. So we're good to approve this cost and reimburse for it. The other type of document, as I mentioned, is a time and effort document. We we don't always need these 100% of the time. It depends on how you all charge personnel costs to the grant. If you came to session one this week or last week where we talked about tracking time, that's the document that I'm talking about. 
So if you have staff who are working on multiple grant programs, we're going to ask you how you determine, and, and I'm, I shouldn't say multiple grant programs. If you have staff getting paid only partly through your ARP grant, we're going to ask how you determined the amount to charge the grant. So you might use something called a personnel activity report to track time. And this is what a personnel activity report can look like. They don't have to look like this, but this is one we can provide you all with where the person writes down the funding source. So in this case, there are two grants and then they're getting paid also through do donations. Here are two activities that they're working on for this grant. Here's the activity they're working on for the other grant. And these are the days of the month. And this is the uh, amount of hours that the person worked on each of those days. Down here is where the employee and the supervisor can sign off. And then here's how the person's time was broken down based upon these hours. So on this particular grant, she worked exactly half of her time, which is rare, it's really rare. But then she worked 26, almost 27% of her time on the second grant. And then she worked 23% um, of her time on other projects. So this is an example of a PAR that we can provide to you if you need a means of tracking your time. If you don't want to use that, that's fine. But again, before we pay you for any personnel costs, we're gonna ask you how you determine those dollar amounts. Does anybody have questions about tracking time before I talk about the last way to pay payroll? I hope you all know that you can send me an email at any time, um, reach out. We have a whole team who's here to help you all and can answer questions for you. So the last way to pay payroll, and I kind of mentioned it briefly earlier, is what if you don't really have a payroll system? We're going to have organizations receiving ARP funds where not only have they never received a, a federal grant before, but they might not ever have received any type of grant. And they might be new organizations, so they might have a new accountant. They might not even have an accountant. It could be board members who are doing this work. So if your organization does not have a formal payroll system, so somebody is probably doing it old school in a ledger, using Excel to figure out FICA and taxes and all of that, we need that spreadsheet. We have to have the spreadsheet showing the hours worked, the pay rate, the gross and net pay, and those with, uh, withholding items. We also need whatever time tracking documentation there is. And then this type of organization is probably writing checks to their employees. And so we need the canceled checks. If they happen to pay with direct deposit, they can send their bank statement um, instead of a canceled check. So, I promise you the rest of this training is not as involved as the whole payroll discussion. But do you all have questions about payroll? Have I have I demonstrated what's needed? All right, I will move on. Oh, Lori, do you have a question? 
Yeah, when you and I have our discussion about the other topic, if I could, maybe we could do that virtually and I could show you our screen um, to be able to show you what we use to track time and attendance to make sure that we don't have any issues moving forward. Okay, that would be great. Okay, thanks. I'll send you out an email when um, we wrap up today. Great, thank you. Of course. So fringe, fringe covers a lot of different um, types of cost. It could be an employee's vacation time, their sick time, their bereavement time. The grant will pay for those leave times. The um, it includes your insurance, your workers' comp, the employee's health insurance. It includes payroll taxes that you all have to pay. Those those are all eligible fringe. If you want to know every eligible fringe cost, you can go to the 2 CFR 200.431 to get more information. But typically, if it's something that you pay out, you know, as a general rule to your employees or the cost that you will have, like workers comp, because you have employees like um, unemployment insurance, it's going to be eligible. One thing you have to be mindful of, though, is that um, bonuses are almost always ineligible. So if you give your staff a Christmas bonus, we're not going to be able to pay that. So for fringe, what do we need? We made a decision last year that it would be a nightmare for you all and for us if we required you to submit all of your tax statements showing that your payroll tax was paid, all of your Humana bills or wherever your insurance comes from, all of that. It's just going to be very difficult. A lot of those costs are paid quarterly, semi-annually, annually, and it's just going to be a mess. So. What we want you all to submit to support your fringe cost is a financial report showing that fringe cost. Your, your system, your financial system might call that a payroll report. It might call it a general ledger. It might call it a journal detail report. We just need a report from your financial system. So not an Excel spreadsheet that someone has created, but a real financial report showing that fringe cost. Um, so, and it should be the fringe cost that's charged to the program. If you need to highlight the, the items that are charged to the program, that's fine. You can send us a bigger report. But hopefully your financial system is tracking the grants financials separately from your other financials. Because we have a responsibility to the federal government to ensure that we are paying only eligible costs and that we're only paying for costs that you all spent OMB is going to have to periodically monitor those fringe costs. So we're not asking you every month to submit all of your fringe documentation. As I explained, it's just not going to work. What if you pay Humana twice a year? It's just going to be a nightmare. So what we will do at some point during the grant, we will say, you're billing us for insurance. Could you please send us your last insurance statement? show us that these employees are charged on that statement and send your proof of payment. That, that's how we're gonna handle these fringe costs. Um, unless there were a problem and a particular grantee could not produce those documents, we're never gonna ask any more than that from you for, on the fringe. So, Lots of different proof of purchase documents exist. We talked about some of them. If you have a receipt or an invoice, those documents should include the amount of purchase, the supplier's name, 
they don't have to have a logo, but, uh, you know, a, a logo um, tends to indicate it's, it's coming from a particular vendor. The date of the purchase is absolutely necessary. A lot of times, um, grantees will say buy something at Kroger and the Kroger receipt is gigantic and the grantee has a hard time scanning it. And so they don't scan the part that has the date on it. If we don't have the date, we have to go back to you and say, hey, we need the whole receipt, including the date, um, because we have to make sure that date of purchase was within the period of performance. We need to see on the receipt or the invoice what type of payment was used. So it's either going to show uh, the last four digits of the card number. It might have the word debit, might show that there was a check. We need to see all of that on your receipt or your invoice. Not every invoice is going to have this um, type of payment received. So we, un we understand that. But if you go to Kroger, it's definitely going to show on your receipt how you paid for it. We need these documents to answer those who, what, when, where questions. Who would you buy it from? If, if it's a service, who provided the service? What type of good or service is it? When did the good or, when was the good purchase? When was the service provided? Um, and then if it's something that was shipped, where was it shipped? And if it gets shipped to a weird address, we might contact you and say, this isn't your company address. Can you explain why it went to Cleveland, Ohio, instead of your organization, and we need you to provide that explanation to us or else we won't be able to accept the cost. So those are general guidelines for these proof of purchase documents. We do discourage handwritten receipts. It's possible we would make an exception for something that was very compelling but in general, we don't want handwritten receipts because it's difficult to verify those receipts. Uh, I don't know about you all, I do a lot of online shopping. Um, I probably get several emails every week from Amazon. And some of those emails say, hey, Susan, thanks for your order of, um, I have cats, Thanks for your order of these two cases of cat food, and it'll show what the cat food is. It'll show how much the cat food costs per case. It'll have the date that I purchased it. And all of that information is proof of purchase. So if you have a similar email from Amazon or Target or Office Depot or what have you that contains all of that information, that can absolutely be your proof of purchase. Amazon also sends me an email that says, hey, Susan, we shipped your cat food. And it might show that I have two boxes of cat food, two cases of cat food coming out to, to me via UPS. Because that email doesn't include the price and the date purchased and the other relevant information, I could not use that email as proof of purchase. So be mindful that if you're using an order confirmation, it does contain the purchase date, what was purchased, from whom it was purchased, and um, how much it cost. Um, same thing with packing tickets and packing slips. If you all have a document that contains all of those important pieces of information, we can absolutely accept the packing ticket or slip. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know everybody who's here today. There are some very, very large organizations in the city of Louisville who are so large that they do things like buy thousands of reams of paper at a time. So, or thousands of cases of paper at a time. And they store those thousands of cases of paper in their warehouse. And when one of their programs needs a case of paper, 
the program buys it from the warehouse. So it's not really a purchase, but they can show us documentation of how much that paper cost and the transaction with their own internal warehouse. I know for most of you, this doesn't apply at all, and I apologize if it's confusing, but if you're here from UofL or JCPS or a big organization like that, we can take those internal documents of proof of purchase. If you're paying for a service, that service has to have occurred within the grant period. If your grant runs July 1 to June 30th, and in June you pay for um, a service that's gonna, in, gonna occur in July after the grant ends, even though you paid for it in June, we cannot accept that cost. This is kind of a, an unusual requirement and it, so far it hasn't happened on ARP, but occasionally you might be working with an independent contractor that has a business name, but the business isn't really incorporated. And so you might have an invoice that says John Smith Trucking, but then you write the check to John Smith, not John Smith Trucking, because in reality, John Smith Trucking doesn't exist. In that case, you would need to have John Smith sign the invoice as proof that he received payment. Hopefully that won't come up on ARP. If it does, we'll work with your organization and let you know. Um, it, it, you, it usually happens on our neighborhood development fund grants. Um, as I said, hopefully it won't happen here. Billing statements. So let's say you you buy three things from the printers you, with a printing company. And they send you a statement that says you owe us for invoice one, this amount, invoice two, this other amount, invoice three, this other amount. We cannot accept that statement as proof of purchase. We need the actual invoices because that statement is not gonna tell us what you purchased. It's probably not gonna tell us the date of the purchase. So billing statements are not okay. An exception would be something like a LG&E billing statement because it's got all that information on there. Um, maybe your cell phone or your um, business phone statement as long as it's got the billing period and all of the relevant information, that's fine. Um, sometimes you might contract with a company and yet they don't provide you with an actual contract. An example is that you might want to rent tables for an event that that's funded through your grant. And so the event company provides you with a quote and you say, okay, yes, let's get this. They don't provide you with a contract. You actually pay them from that quote. As long as the quote has the event date, it's got the amounts, the name of the vendor, those types of things will pay you from that quote. Same thing if it's a proposal rather than a quote. Um, a, a rental contract, which is, you know, it could be your lease or your office space. It could be temporary event space. We need the rental amount to be stated in the contract or the lease. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about paying uh, rent on, on your office space. We just have a, a few more slides. Oh, here, here is the rent. So let's say you want to charge a portion of your rent um, for your facility. 
to your ARP grant. You can do that. Um, we are only going to pay the amount of your rent that benefits the grant. So if you've got 10,000 square feet and your program takes place in 1,000 square feet, we're only going to pay you a tenth of your rent amount. What we need to support the rent is your current lease or a monthly invoice from the landlord or the building owner. Sometimes we will have a lease that says rent is $4,000. And then we have a canceled check that showed rent was paid for $4,500 because the rent has gone up since the lease was signed. If the amount that you're paying is not reflected in your lease, we need a new lease or we need some sort of explanation for the difference. Sometimes a landlord will submit a document saying, oh yes, their, their rent actually went up to $4,500 in January, 2022. Client assistance, we're, we're very lucky that some of our grantees are working really hard to help members of the community, households, families, individuals in the community. Some of you here today have been working on that and we're very, very appreciative of your help in the economic recovery for these households. So client assistance is anytime you're providing goods, services, or money to benefit members of the community. It typically means that you're paying a bill for a client or you're providing direct funding to the client. Before we green light the grants, before we execute grants that include client assistance, we will work with the Metro Awarding Agency and your organization so that you understand what type of documentation you have to submit for these client assistance payments. There's not a one size fits all, so it might be something completely different for your grant than what we have for our current grantees. But typically, if you're paying a debt for a client, so that could be their rent, their utility, um, maybe, um, maybe various things. In general, you would submit the document of the debt, so their LG&E bill, their lease, something that shows that they owe money, a letter from their landlord showing that rent is late. And then you're going to submit your cancel check or bank statement showing that you made that payment. If you're providing direct financial assistance to a person, a household, what have you, we're going to ask you to submit documentation like an application or an intake document that shows what um, that the grant that the beneficiary was approved for assistance and why they were approved. So let's say let's say your program is going to help families who are under 50% of the area median income. We're going to make you we're going to ask you to submit a document that's the intake document that shows that this household was under that 50% area median income. We're also going to need that document to be signed by the person you're helping. It needs to be dated within the period of performance. And then we need to see the proof of payment. It's possible other documents might be needed if you're providing direct financial assistance or if you're paying somebody's rent. It just depends on the specifics of your program. Then we've got reimbursements to others. Uh, I worked for a nonprofit for many years, and sometimes 
I would need to run an errand and our executive director would say, while you're out, can you go to Staples and pick up uh, some paper? And I would say, sure. And I would go to Staples and I would pick up that paper. And then I would ask the organization to pay me back. So we had, uh, I can't remember, I think it was every month we submitted our cost for reimbursement. And we actually filled out a form that said, here's what I purchased, here are the receipts, please pay me back this total amount. If your organization works that way and sometimes your employees or your board members are purchasing things, that's perfectly fine. What we need to support those costs is the original purchase document, so the receipt or the invoice or what have you, the Amazon confirmation email. Then we need um, the request from the person to be reimbursed. It doesn't have to be a formal document like I used to have to fill out and sign and everything. It could be an email saying, hey, uh, here are copies of my receipt showing I spent $21.50 this month at Staples. Please reimburse me. That email is fine. And then we need proof that you paid that person. What we do not want is for you all to submit any financial documents from your employee or your board member who uh, made that purchase. So don't send their bank account or their bank statement showing that the check cleared their bank. We, we don't want anything identifiable from your employees or board members. The other type of reimbursement to others, you might have a partner organization. Um, so the nonprofit that I worked for had an associated foundation and the foundation would sometimes make purchases for the nonprofit and we would pay them back. So in that case, just like if your employees purchasing something, we need the original receipt or invoice. Then we need um, the request from that organization to be paid. Again, it doesn't have to be formal. It can just be an email. And then we need proof that you repaid them. So that cancel check or that bank statement. So I have two short slides um, that cover budget provisions, but this is the end of my discussion about the supporting documents. We have plenty of time. We've built plenty of time into today's training. If you all have questions, I and my team are happy to field those questions right now. All right, well, even when David's showing you how to use GovGrants for these reimbursement requests, if you have questions related to the supporting documents or anything else I've discussed, please let me know. And like I said, I'm gonna briefly discuss budget revisions. For the American Rescue Plan grants, we've built in a 10% variance on your budgets. What does that mean? So, For approved line items, so whatever is approved right now in your budget, you can move 10% of the total funding around however you want, but just for those approved costs. The exception is if that 10% exceeds $50,000, you're capped at $50,000. So 10% or 50,000, whatever is less. So let me show you what this means. So in this budget, the organization has $10,000 in personnel, $5,000 in equipment, 5,000 in supplies, and it's a total grant of $20,000. In actuality, they ended up overspending in personnel by $1,000 and underspending in equipment and supplies, $1,000. So they've still spent $20,000, 
it just looks a little bit different and it's only um, what is that five percent off if I have that correct they've only they've only changed their spending five percent if you're ten percent or under you just go ahead and do that you don't have to go through any steps again those costs have to be eligible so let's say you have uh, eligible and approved so let's say you have equipment and your equipment is to purchase six laptops but instead you buy a big screen tv or a printer or something like that that's not what i'm talking about we cannot allow those costs that aren't in your budget but let's say you ended up spending instead of five thousand dollars on your six laptops you got them on sale and they only cost forty five hundred dollars you can definitely take that five hundred dollars and spend it elsewhere in your budget. So what if it's more than 10%? What if that variance is more than 10%? We actually have to do an amendment to your grant. We're not gonna go into amendments today, but I wanted to discuss this with you in the con um, text of your reimbursement request so you all would know that if you haven't hit that 10% cap then you're all fine with submitting those reimbursement requests even if the numbers are off a little bit if you actually need an amendment because you're going to have new cost added to your budget and we've got we've got somebody here today who we're going to be doing a budget amendment for because they're gonna add things to their budget. If you need to move some of that money around in your budget, but it's more than 10%, we're gonna do an amendment. So those types of things, we have a video and we have a user guide that will show you either how to submit an amendment request or how Metro government will send you an amendment request to approve for those changes because some of the amendments you all can generate and some only Metro government can generate. If you do need an amendment request, it's important to know that OMB has to approve those requests. The Metro agency that you're working with has to approve them and our LAT team has to approve them. So if you send it, you know, one day chances that you're going to get a response that same day or, or slim, but it shouldn't take more than just a few days. Um, Lada, did you have a question? Just a comment. When Lori and you meet, that might be one thing for you all to go over since you know that that's what's going to be happening with us coming up soon. Everything has been approved by Nanette, so we're going to be good to go to make amendments, so we will need to know how to do that. Yeah, so... Um, uh, Nanette and Andy and I met earlier today. I also approved those and Andy did too, so we're good to go. I'm had, having Jefferson County Attorney's Office start on that amendment because we have to also amend those terms in your grant. So that's already in the works. Uh, Thanks so much, you rock. Well, um, I really wanna make things as easy as on everybody as I possibly can. Does anybody have questions before we take just a very short break and then David can take over? And we can look at how to do this in Gov Grants. All right, well, why don't we step away for five minutes and we'll regroup at 222. 